Hey there, I'm Fake Fox, and I welcome you to my PvE healing class guide for Necromancer. In this video, I will explain Necromancer's entire toolkit and how to effectively build the class for healing dungeons, trials, and arenas. Necromancer is a very strong healing class, but arguably also the most difficult to play. The potential support and healing power is pretty extreme, but short durations and corpses as a unique resource make it complex to play. At the end of this video, I will explain the viability of Necromancer for specific content and group compositions in detail, but in general Necromancer is a good choice for all PvE content. In the first part, I will go over Necromancer's three class skill lines, so you get a good understanding of the entire toolkit, and after that we will talk about everything else that goes into a complete build. Necromancer's dedicated healing line is Living Death. The passives increase our healing done by 8% when we are affected by any negative effect. This can be triggered on purpose, but even if we don't do that, it is still a very strong healing passive. Further, our critical strike chance for healing increases based on a target's missing health by up to 20% when we have a living death skill slotted. Consuming a corpse generates 10 ultimate every 16 seconds. This is the first part of one of Necromancer's biggest strengths, namely insane ultigen. And lastly, while we have an active pet, we get 200 more recovery. This passive gives us recovery for both resources and also skills with recovery modifiers, making it very potent. Moving on to the first active ability, Render Flash is Necromancer's single target burst heal, and it is a really strong one. Using it gives us Minor Defile, making consecutive casts even stronger through our passives. All of that said, it is just a very expensive burst heal with no other function so I would only ever recommend it as an emergency option. In terms of morphs, I recommend Resistant Flash, mainly because we don't want the skill to use up corpses, but it is also quite nice when trying to keep tanks alive with resistance debuffs. The next ability is Expunge. This one is not really relevant for PvE, as there just isn't any situation where you would only want to cleanse yourself, so you will always use Purge instead. Life Amid Death is both a AoE burst heal and a heal over time. It is in my opinion an often overlooked but extremely strong skill, as it essentially gives Necromancer a AoE burst heal that doesn't take up a skill slot because it can just fill in one of the heal over time slots. I generally use Enduring Undeath, but Renewing Undeath can also be good in the very few fights where we require a cleanse. Spirit Mender is one of Necromancer's pet options. The pet uses a single target heal, but that is kinda weak and unreliable. The main reason why you would want to use it is for the passive recovery and healing increase and also to generate a corpse. Because of that I always use Spirit Guardian, so I have to recast it less often and also get the nice damage reduction. Restoring Tether is the second heal over time option. For me it is always a choice between this and life amid death, depending on the situations, as both use up corpses. Restoring Tether is the stronger but also less reliable option, as it always requires a corpse. It is somewhat clunky to use and very dependent on positioning. The Braided Tether morph increases the reliability quite a bit and is therefore what I usually recommend but Mortal Coil can also be good if you struggle with stamina sustain. And the ultimate of this skill line is Reanimate. In a way it is incredibly strong, allowing Necromancer to revive an entire dungeon group in normally unsalvageable situations, even straight up ignoring mechanics that usually prevent reviving. But it comes at a high cost, and with that I don't just mean the 335 ultimate. The issue is that in order to have Reanimate ready when it is needed, the Necromancer cannot use other ultimates, throwing massive amounts of support out the window. I do recommend Reanimate if your group is just dying through the content, but otherwise you're usually better off with other ultimates. For the morph, I recommend renewing animation as having an additional safety feature is more fitting to the circumstances where you would even use this ultimate. Next up is Bone Tyrant, Necromancer's tanking and support line. The passives give us further sustain by restoring 200 magicka and stamina whenever an enemy around us dies. It also reduces the damage we take from overtime effects by 15%, 
when we have a skill from this line active and increases our healing taken for every slotted skill by 2%. And lastly, we get 1250 more health. Death Scythe is not really relevant for a healer. The Ruinous Scythe morph could be used to provide the off balance effect, but off balance currently isn't really relevant, so it's absolutely not worth it. But it is something you can keep in mind should off balance ever become relevant again. Bone Armor is Necromancer's major resolve skill. Mostly irrelevant for a healer, but it does generate a corpse, so we can use it for that. Bitter Harvest, specifically the Necrotic Potency Morph, is absolutely amazing. We consume corpses to generate 6 ultimate for each one. The amount of ultimate we can generate with this is just ridiculous, making Necrotic Potency a must-have skill whenever there is a large number of corpses. So basically every trash fight, but also some bosses with a large number of adds. Bone Totem, the next ability, creates a totem that gives minor protection to 6 players and fears enemies. The protection is quite nice and there are certainly static fights with high incoming damage where this is pretty useful. The fear however is somewhere between useless and annoying as it can prevent tanks from properly stacking the enemies. Agony Totem is generally the more useful morph as the ability is only good in fights with a stacked group in the first place and the synergy is pretty good with decent damage and AoE minor vulnerability. Grave Grasp is another amazing support skill. The Empowering Grasp morph gives allies empower, one of the best damage buffs in the game. That is otherwise quite hard to come by. The 5 second duration is pretty short, but on the upside, it doesn't have a 6 player cap like most support abilities, so with good positioning, we only need to cast it once for an entire trial group. I would consider Empowering Grasp pretty much a must have. And the ultimate is Bone Goliath, certainly strong but with no use in PvE healing. Okay, now to the third and final skill line, Gravelord. First of all, when one of our pets dies, the cost of summoning the next pet is reduced by 50%. This basically punishes overcasting the pets with higher cost. But on the other hand, overcasting produces more corpses. So we need to always decide situationally if overcasting is worth it. Further, the passives increase the critical strike chance of damage abilities by 4% against targets under 25% health for every Grave Lord ability slotted. And while one is active, we get 1500 more penetration. And lastly, our damage over time is generally increased by 15%. Flame Skull is Necromancer's standard spammable. You can use it if you want to include a spammable into your healing build to increase damage, but I would generally not recommend it as Necromancer has just more important damage skills that you would want to include first. Blast Bones is one of those higher priority skills, a high damage dealing ability that produces a corpse every time you use it. It can be used every 3 seconds if you're close enough to the target as the travel time dictates when you can recast the skill. Boneyard is a very interesting skill for healers. It is a standard AoE dot, but deals frost damage, opening up interesting support options. And it also has a pretty strong damage dealing synergy. Skeletal Mage, particularly the Skeletal Arcanist, is Necromancer's second longer duration pet. As we always want to have a pet active, this is an alternative to the Spirit Mender if we want to focus more on providing damage. And lastly, Shock Siphon is another AoE dot that deals shock damage. Together with the Boneyard, this gives Necromancers two different elements that can constantly be applied on multiple targets. The Mystic Siphon Morph, which is generally the one we want to use, also restores some magicka. And we also deal 3% more damage while it's slotted. And the last remaining skill is Necromancer's signature ultimate, Frozen Colossus. This ability is one of just two sources for major vulnerability and a big reason why Necromancer is so strong in support roles. It synergizes perfectly with our very high ultigen to provide strong and unique support. Interestingly, the Pestilent Colossus is actually the preferred morph for PvE healing, mainly because the other morph stuns smaller enemies, causing difficulties for the tanks, but it also deals ever so slightly more damage. In the next part of this guide, I will give you an overview to build creation for the Necromancer healer. I will go over how to set up your bars, different set combinations, champion points, and then how to tie it all into an effective build. 
I'm going with teaching you how to create your own build over just showing you one pre-made build, as being able to adjust is crucial for PvE healing. But before we get into that, I want to quickly explain Necromancer's corpse mechanic. So whenever something dies, it leaves a corpse on the ground that the Necromancer can then use for different abilities. There are three sources of corpses, fallen enemies, some are excluded though, fallen allies until they get resurrected, and necromancer abilities, specifically the three pets and bone armor. These skills also produce a corpse if they are recast early, but they need to run at least 8 seconds. Blast bones is an exception as you can't even overcast it anyway. Corpses from skills also only last a few seconds. And then there are also three ways in which a necromancer can use corpses. Increasing healing, increasing damage, and generating ultimate. It encounters with a lot of corpses, slotting necrotic potency, and almost exclusively using corpses for ultimate is really strong. It encounters with less corpses, using them more for healing or damage is usually better. But you always want to make sure you constantly use them for at least something, as this still generates some amount of ultimate. The corpse mechanic gives Necromancer a lot of power, but it can also cause issues. Phases that require very high healing, like the execute phases of Lord Fograven or the Assembly General, require more micromanagement on a Necromancer, as you want to make sure that you empower your healing with corpses. This is where overcasting your pets to produce a corpse right when and where you need it can be really important. So now moving on to the builds. In the first step, I will explain how I go about setting up my skills for a healing build on the Necromancer. I start out with determining how much burst healing I need. Ideally, I just want to use Combat Prayer, but sometimes I need additional skills. My most efficient option here would be Life Amid Death, but Render Flash and Healing Ward might situationally be needed instead. Next, I sort out my healing over time, the actual source of most of my healing power. This almost always consists of Energy Orb and Illustrious Healing. If I need a third AoE hot, I choose between life amid death in more chaotic fights, for the burst healing and restoring tether in more static fights. For dungeons and movement heavy trial encounters, I also like using radiating regeneration, with the ascending tide patch, echoing vigor and ring of preservation also became viable, depending on the stamina sustain. With all the healing covered, I move on with figuring out what support I need, and also how I might be able to integrate some damage as well. First of all, Necromancer always needs a pet for the passives, so I choose between Spirit Guardian and Skeletal Arcanist. Empowering Grasp for the Empower buff is also a must include. Then I basically always play with Wall of Elements, usually Unstable Wall. This allows me to keep my Backbar enchantment active, and I can also use it for additional support, depending on what element I use. Additionally, I might want to include Boneyard, Mystic Siphon or Scalding Rune if I were Elemental Catalyst. If I instead play with Sense Redress, I use Single Target Dots instead, Scalding Rune, Entropy, Soul Trap, Trap Beast. Other common support I might need to include is Elemental Drain or Siphon Spirit and Blood Altar. I also need to check if I need any fight specific things like a Speed Buff, Taunt, Chain, Purge or Shield. If I then have any open slots, I either include Necrotic Potency, if there are enough corpses, or I just fill it up with damage. If I already have Wall, Boneyard and Siphon, Blast Bones is usually my next choice, and after that maybe a spammable like Flame Skull or Force Pulse, but this is very rarely the case. As ultimates, I slot either Barrier or Dawnbreaker on the front bar for the passives, and then Colossus, Aggressive Horn or Barrier on the back bar for actual use. Colossus is the default for Necromancer, but if a group has too many, you might need to use Horn instead. There are also builds where I actively want to use my ultimate on the front bar instead, but we will get into that when we talk about the sets. For the passives, in addition to the Necromancer skill lines, we need to have the weapons and armor passives of whatever we use, so usually Restoration Staff, Destruction Staff, Light and Medium Armor. And also important is Undaunted and maybe Mages or Fighter Skilled if we use those abilities. And then also the Racial Passives. From the Alliance War we should get Magicka Aid for some extra region whenever we use Barrier or Perch. And Medicinal Use from Alchemy is also absolutely essential. For the Race I recommend Breton the most for the amazing sustain and survivability. 
but Altmer, Dunder and Khajiit also work great. Necromancer has good sustain, so if you want to play more damage focused, those three choices are really good. Agonian can also work if you're more interested in a pure healer playstyle, or even go more into a tank direction, but I still wouldn't recommend it. Now to the set choice. For dungeons and arenas, we generally want the two strongest offensive support sets available. For the Necromancer, those are Spell Procure and Elemental Catalyst. Alternatively, Spell Procure with Master Architect, Drawing Opportunist or Sex Deal Champion are other really good options. For the remaining armor slots, Spalder of Ruin is usually the strongest option, otherwise we can also run Symphony of Blades, Magma Incarnate or Pearls of Elnafe. And as weapons, we can use a Vatashrun or Master Restoration Staff for resource support, but I actually recommend just pushing DPS with a Maelstrom Destruction Staff instead. For Trials, we have a lot more options and distinct playstyles to choose from. With more players in a group, some of the weaker support sets become worthwhile. In the current meta, we almost always see one healer using Roaring Opportunist with Jovelt's Guidance and the other one using Spell Park Cure or Olurim with either Stone Talker's Oath when resource support is needed, or otherwise Elemental Catalyst, Martial Knowledge, Sense Redress, Powerful Assault or Sex Sealed Champion. Other resource support sets like Worm Cult are also playable. As monster sets in Mythics, Symphony of Blades and Kratos Behemoth, Spold of Ruin, Nazare and Pearls of Elnafe are the most common options, but healing monster sets can also work fine. As special weapons, usually both healers use a Master Restoration Staff, and for countering healing debuffs, sometimes the Black Rose Restoration Staff. Generally, Necromancer can use all of these set combinations, but there are more favorable ones and others that can potentially cause issues. Jovel's Guidance has the very nice side effect that Empowering Grasp lasts longer and better lines up with other duration-based skills. Sex Sealed Champion benefits from Necromancer's ultigen and flexibility with the ultimate. Necromancer also is the class with the easiest access to all three Elemental Catalyst effects. The strong stamina sustain makes Spalder of Ruin quite pleasant to play. On the negative side, the stamina sustain can be a bit annoying when using martial knowledge without Spalder of Ruin. Sense Redress is probably the most problematic set for Necromancer, as the class doesn't have a single target dot. For Encratus Behemoth, Necromancer needs a dedicated skill or fire stuff, but it's usually not a big deal. And lastly, Necromancer's interaction with Nazare is a bit strange. The high ultigen makes the set potentially interesting, but because you cannot use it to increase the duration of your own Colossus, you have to use it with a different ultimate, so it's not really something I can recommend. In terms of armor types, healers can currently run both light and medium armor. Light is a bit better for magical sustain and survivability, medium is better for healing power, stamina sustain, and also damage if the penetration is good enough. Next up are traits and enchantments. On the armor, Divines with Magicka is the best option. I would not recommend Infuse Prismatic for Necromancer, as we need neither the health nor the stamina. On the jewelry, both Arcane and Infused are good. Infused is ever so slightly stronger though, and as enchantments, we usually should be able to sustain 3 times spell damage. If not, we can use Magical Regeneration as well, but we generally want to avoid that. I'd say we want about 1500 to 2000 Magical Regeneration without an active pet or potion. For our front bar weapon, we primarily want to use Powered for pure healing and Precise whenever we deal any relevant amount of damage. We can also use Decisive for ultigen, but then we need to make sure that we consume corpses on that bar. Charged for status effects can also be good, particularly for a Sen build. On the destruction stuff, our back bar, we usually want infused. Using charge to actively proc minor brittle is a trick that also works, but it is not something that I can generally recommend. The weapon element doesn't really matter unless we need a specific element for support. As enchantments, we can use crusher or weakening for support, or any element that we need for a status effect, and if we need nothing specific, we can just use berserker. We always want the more important enchantment on the back bar and never use the same enchantment twice. For fine tuning my stat balance, I use attribute points and buff food. For the food, it is either magicka and health or magicka, magicka regeneration and health. 
The difference in health can then be made up with attribute points, but since Necromancer has more health anyways, this is usually not even necessary. So I tend to just go with 64 points in Magicka regardless. Usually about 22k health is enough, but going with about 25k can also make sense if you're less familiar with the content or play with a really chaotic group. For the Munda Stone, Ritual is the best for pure healing and Thief for pure damage as well as hybrid rolls. I wouldn't recommend Thief if all the damage you do is like 5k from blockade and a bit of weaving, but even if you just go a little bit more into damage, Thief is already worthwhile in my opinion, as the healing loss is really negligible. As potions, we want to use Essence of Spell Power in more difficult content, and for easy stuff we should be fine with Essence of Magicka, and with that I mean the ones that drop from chests, bosses and so on, never craft simple magic potions. Dry Restoration potions can also be nice, and we tend to get a lot from the login rewards. Technically, heroism potions would be the best choice, but they are just too expensive to really recommend, unless you just want to dump millions in your potions alone. Moving on to the champion points. The green CP doesn't really matter, but what I recommend is Steed's Blessing, when quickly moving from fight to fight. For the blue CP, on full healing builds, I usually go with a split of two healing and two support nodes. For the healing power, I always go with Soothing Tide and Swift Renewal, as increasing AOE healing over time makes the by far largest impact. As support, we have Enlivening Overflow and Hope Infusion. If one of those is not needed, I usually either go with Focused Mending or Damage Nodes, depending on what my build is supposed to achieve. When a build has a relevant damage component, I tend to just go straight to damage nodes, usually Backstabber and a combination of Deadly Aim, Thaumaturge, Master Darm, Spiting Aura and Fighting Finesse depending on my damage sources. In the red CP I absolutely always use Celerity. In my opinion, movement speed is an amazing defensive tool. Apart from that, Siphoning Spells is a great sustain tool I like to use for my off-healer builds in dungeons. Expert Evasion and Slippery can help with Stamina Sustain, Spirit Mastery can be useful as well, and Shield Master is nice when actively playing Barrier. And if nothing specific is needed, Boundless Vitality, Fortified and Rejuvenation are always good choices. Okay, now to the final part of this video, the viability in specific content and group compositions. For 4 player content, Necromancer is very strong for both full healer and off healer, with very good offensive support and decent damage potential. Having a Necromancer tank is probably a little bit more optimal, but Necromancer healer is nevertheless one of the top choices, together with a Warden. With Ascending Tide, multiple Necromancers are less needed in trial groups, because major vulnerability is no longer exclusive. But because of how much rather complex to play support Necromancer offers with Empower, Active Ultigen and so on, even multiple support Necromancers can still make sense. This makes Necromancer Healer very easy to fit into groups, and the only situation that causes Necromancer Healer real problems is when both Warden and Templar are absolutely needed, which is usually the case for Magicka compositions that do not have a Templar DD. With Ascending Tide, a Templar is not essential for Magicka based group compositions anymore, but from my experience it is still the norm outside of very specifically optimized core groups. Necromancer excels in static encounters with a stacked or only slightly split up group. Very mobile encounters make the micromanagement of corpses difficult, but as the damage heavy phases are usually still kind of static, in those encounters it is not too much of a problem. Fights with completely spread out damage dealers like St. Olms are problematic though, as providing empower becomes almost impossible. Kite rolls in general can be a problem for Necromancer because of low skill durations, position dependent healing mechanics and low mobility. This is not to say that Necromancer cannot heal those encounters, it is just a bit more difficult. And from a group optimization standpoint, it is usually better to let the Necromancer have the more static healing position, while the other healer, usually Templar or Warden, takes the primary position for the movement based mechanics. And that's it for this video. Hope you liked it. If you're looking for explanations of more basic stuff, I recommend my beginner healing guide. It is linked in the description, together with other useful stuff like guides for some of the sets I talked about. 
If you need any further information, also feel free to ask me in the comments, and thanks for watching.